Hello and welcome. Thank you very much for joining me for another presentation today as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. Today, a very popular topic. This is, I believe, about our highest registration for a Gray Learning webinar to date, uh, or at least nearly so, and uh, there's still a number of people signing in, but also very strong attendance, a very clear indication of one of two things, well, and really both, it just depends on which type of photographer you are, but that some people have a mess already in Lightroom Classic, and others have heard about photographers who have run into a mess, who've created a bit of a mess, and they want to make sure that they avoid that sort of mess, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Some tips to help you avoid having a mess in Adobe Lightroom Classic. I'm sure Many of you are already aware, I'm Tim Gray, and uh, the concept here, you know, the thought was that maybe you feel like you're living on the edge. I know whenever I share some of these photos that uh, show me out on cliff's edges around the desert southwest, I often see comments about photographers who would not go anywhere near that edge and think I'm crazy, which is probably true, but then I thought, you know, it's sort of appropriate in this case because maybe a lot of photographers feel like they're living on the edge when it comes to their Lightroom Classic workflow. And so today, hopefully, we'll be able to help you avoid those sorts of situations, those sorts of problems. I do want to, right off the bat, thank Tamron for making the Gray Learning webinar series possible. So thank you, Tamron. If you get a chance, check out their YouTube channel. Actually, I know for a long time, I had mentioned that there was a video in one of their series that featured me out in the Palouse but there's all sorts of great content there, interesting, even funny, creative, clever content that you can find on the Tamron YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash Tamron vids and check that out. And before we dive into the content here, as I mentioned, I suspect many of you already have a bit of a mess, maybe a little mess, maybe a really large mess, but I can help. I do actually have a course and I'll talk more about some of these details at the end of today's session, including, including an opportunity for you to get one-on-one -on -one help directly from me if you feel that you need a little bit of assistance cleaning up your mess. But we do have a cleaning up your mess in Lightroom course, and you can get that course for half price today as part of this webinar presentation. And if you just point your web browser at timgray.me, M-E, slash mess, 50, that will take you directly to the Gray Learning website with the coupon code already applied so that you'll have that 50% discount off cleaning up your mess in Lightroom. But more importantly, today we're going to help you avoid a mess in the first place. And so we'll go ahead and dive in. I do want to let you know if you've got questions along the way. I see a few of you already starting to post some questions here. But in the control panel for our GoToWebinar platform here, you can type in questions. I will try to get to as many of those as possible. I can already anticipate with the strong attendance for today's webinar presentation, I'm sure I will not be able to get to all of them. I'll try to follow up, maybe put some of those in an Ask Tim Gray email newsletter in the coming weeks. Or another possibility, if there are just far too many questions, we may do a follow-up Q&A webinar in the near future to help address some of those questions. All right, so let's dive in. First and foremost, the number one rule, perhaps the most important thing to understand about Lightroom Classic is that if you are using Lightroom Classic to manage your workflow, to manage your photos, to organize and optimize your images, rule number one is that everything must be initiated inside of Lightroom Classic. No matter what it is you want to do, you should try to do that right inside of Lightroom Classic. If that's moving photos or folders especially, or renaming photos or folders, that is critically important. And even if you want to edit an image in Photoshop, to take advantage, for example, of the more powerful capabilities in Photoshop when it comes to, for example, image cleanup and targeted adjustments, the photo should be sent from Lightroom Classic to Photoshop don't open the image, for example, directly in Photoshop. Try even to resist the urge in general to go browsing on your computer, in your computer's operating system, for example. And so 
By everything, I mean, well, not literally everything. Because there are some things that you do have to do outside of Lightroom. If you wanted, for example, to rename your catalog. So there are exceptions, to be sure. But there are very few exceptions. So treat it as though absolutely everything that you do with your images should be initiated inside of Lightroom Classic. That alone, if you get nothing else from today's presentation, that tip alone will help alleviate most of the problems that photographers run into in terms of having a mess in Lightroom Classic in their catalog. I see Roxanne's asking, she didn't get a chance to write down the URL, the address for that discount. Yes, at the end of the presentation, I will share that again along with details about the one-on-one -on -one option that's available as well. All right, and then when we go beyond the first rule, of course, there's a lot more to consider when it comes to using Lightroom to manage your workflow. The next thing I would say is to make sure that you understand Lightroom. Understand Lightroom Classic before you start working with Lightroom Classic Ideal. And I know some of you might cringe when I suggest that you need to understand Lightroom first because you maybe already have dove in and you're already managing your workflow and maybe you already have a little bit of a mess. But the key is to try to understand Lightroom as much as possible to help ensure that you're going to take into account some of the things that are a little bit unique about Lightroom. So for example, I know many photographers started organizing their photos or right before Lightroom, perhaps were organizing their photos using Adobe Bridge. And Adobe Bridge is really just a browser. And what that means is that it doesn't maintain a database. Now there there's some exceptions to this in, in certain technicalities, but we won't worry about that. The idea is that Adobe Bridge, you point to a folder and it needs to look in that folder. It does some caching to help improve performance, but it essentially needs to check and see what's inside that folder and figure out what the metadata is for all the photos, for example, the star ratings for those images. Whereas Lightroom Classic creates a catalog and a catalog in the context of Lightroom Classic is a database that contains the information about your photos. So by default, everything you do in Lightroom Classic, if you update metadata, if you apply adjustments, by default, all of that information about those changes you've applied is saved only in the Lightroom catalog. I'll talk about an option to improve upon that concept a little bit later in the presentation today. But the idea is that the information is stored in the catalog, not in your photos. So for example, when you apply an adjustment to an image in the develop module in Lightroom Classic, you are not altering the original image file on your hard drive. You're essentially applying metadata updates those metadata updates are separate of the image. This is where the non-destructive editing comes from in Lightroom Classic. Because we're not touching the original capture, we're putting the information about the changes into the database. The photos themselves are stored separately. And this is one of the critical issues to understand about Lightroom Classic. There are other issues that I think are important as well, but this is perhaps the most important because this means that we need to manage our photos and manage our catalog and that the two are separate. And it also means that if we go out onto the hard drive and make changes to our folder structure, to our storage structure in general, the Lightroom catalog doesn't know about that. So that's why we need to initiate everything inside of Lightroom Classic. And so, again, make sure you understand. In fact, I have a course called Understanding Lightroom, which admittedly is not the most exciting course I've ever produced, but I think it is so important to understand how Lightroom Classic works, ideally before you're actually using Lightroom to manage your workflow. All right, so we'll take a brief moment here to take a look at a couple of the questions that are coming up here. Let's see, if you upgrade, yeah, so if you're upgrading from an older version of Lightroom, will all the file structure transfer correctly? Yes, indeed. Number one, if you're going from an older version of Lightroom Classic to a newer version, the catalog will get upgraded, all your information will be preserved, and the folder structure out on the hard drive 
will also be preserved. And this is one of the reasons I often hear that photographers avoid using Lightroom is that they're afraid they've, they've spent all this time defining a folder structure an organizational structure for their folders that works great for them and they don't want to give it up. Well, with Lightroom Classic, you're not giving it up. In fact, you can see here the folder structure on the hard drive reflects the folder structure inside of Lightroom Classic. So the same folders appear in both areas because Lightroom is reflecting, the catalog is keeping track of what's out on your hard drive. So upgrading will not create any problems at all. All right, and I think, let's see, we had another question. Ah, yeah, so Astrid is asking, they have their Lightroom catalog on the internal hard drive and all images on the external, on an external hard drive. Is this the best setup? Yes, probably. So first and foremost, having the Lightroom catalog on your internal hard drive is generally best because that will generally improve overall performance. It also makes it easy to always have access to your Lightroom catalog, even if your photos on an external hard drive are not currently available. In other words, the external hard drive is not connected to the computer, for example. Because Lightroom Classic builds previews, builds thumbnails for your images, you can actually browse your photos and even update metadata for your images even if the photos themselves are not currently available because they're on an external hard drive that's not connected. So then the question is, is it best to have the images themselves on an external hard drive? Not necessarily. For many of us, well for me anyway, I and I'll talk about my storage here shortly, I use an external hard drive because I travel so much, at least normally I'm traveling so much, that I've gotten to the point where my laptop is my computer. I don't have a desktop at home and a laptop for when I travel. And so I have my Lightroom catalog on the internal hard drive, but that internal hard drive on my laptop is not big enough for all of my photos. I have somewhere around six terabytes of photos at this point, and so I have to use external hard drives for that purpose. I think that's a perfectly great solution if you had a desktop computer that had plenty of storage for all of your photos and everything else you needed and you don't travel all that often or you use a laptop separately when you're traveling, then you could use internal hard drives for the photo storage. But for many of us, I would say that using the an external hard drive for photo storage makes the most sense. So it's not necessarily the only solution that makes sense, but it's uh, certainly a good solution for most of them. Ah, yes, and I do see here, uh, Joe, the common question, is it being recorded? Yes, if you've registered for this presentation, it is being recorded. I know that's a question that we get very, very often. All right, let's move on to some of the other tips here, and then I'll get to some more of the questions as we work our way through this. Ideally, so I've talked about understanding Lightroom before you start using Lightroom. Well, in addition, ideally, you get your storage tidied up. You get your overall workflow essentially tidied up before you start using Lightroom Classic. And I'll just give you one little example here. You can see the highlighted folder that is called Trip to Croatia. Well, maybe when you downloaded the photos, or especially if you downloaded some photos a long time ago, when you weren't really thinking about the need to have an organized folder structure, you just needed a place to store your photos, you might not be all that thoughtful about what that folder structure should look like. And so, for example, instead of calling this just Croatia, I called it Trip to Croatia. When I go looking for that folder, then of course I'm probably going to look alphabetically and I'll go look under the C's. Instead, it's down under the T's because it's called Trip. And so as much as possible, I'll talk more about folder structure here shortly, but as much as possible, try to make sure that things are as tidy and organized before you start using Lightroom Classic. I would say if you're not already using Lightroom Classic in terms of your workflow, organizing your photos, then I would say that it makes more sense to clean up before you start using Lightroom than after, to kind of get your folder structure tidied up so that you're not doing a lot of that work inside of Lightroom. And I see that Pamela's asking about Lightroom, the cloud version, Lightroom CC as it were, 
would this be relevant? Much, if not most of this would be relevant in the context of Lightroom, the cloud-based version of Lightroom. There are some differences there, for example, not having the flexibility with folder structure. And so there are some differences with that version, but much of this, and especially the overall workflow concepts would still apply. All right, so try to get tidied up as much as you can before before you start using Lightroom Classic. I realize for many of you that might be too late, uh, including a very common mistake, and that is I see many, many photographers who are using multiple catalogs in Lightroom Classic. And I would say that, generally speaking, almost without exception, you should only be using a single catalog for all of your photos. And whenever I talk about this, I'll typically have photographers who say, yes, but here's my special circumstance. And more often than not, I disagree. So for example, it's very common. I hear photographers creating unique catalogs by calendar year, which to me doesn't really make much sense at all. Part of the reason, in fairness, that a lot of photographers created multiple catalogs in the first place is because in the very early days of Lightroom, before it was even called Lightroom Classic, in those days, it was problematic to have a large catalog, a catalog that contained a lot of images. In my experience with the first, the earliest version, Lightroom version one, essentially, if you got up to about 30,000 images, Lightroom became virtually useless. And for many of us, 30,000 images is nothing. I'm approaching half a million photos in my Lightroom catalog, but that is no longer an issue. And so there's really, in my mind, no reason to have multiple catalogs. Creating multiple catalogs means that when you launch Lightroom, now you need to think about which catalog contains the images that I want to work with. And I don't think that that makes a lot of sense in terms of having things divided up. I think it makes the most sense to have all of your photos in a single catalog. I hear people say, well, some of my work is commercial and some is just my personal work. That's totally fine, but you can use a folder structure you can use a keyword structure, you can use collections. There's all sorts of ways that you can organize. To me, I want to be able to launch Lightroom and be able to access any of my photos. So I strongly recommend using a single Lightroom catalog. And I see Jonathan has a question here. Any advice for someone who's been using Adobe Camera Raw and Photoshop for years and would like to switch to Lightroom? And yeah, that relates to a little bit of what I've been talking about here. Number one, learn how Lightroom works learn the concepts related to Lightroom, and even better, take the sandbox approach, which means create a little environment for yourself where you can actually essentially practice, where you make a copy of some of your photos and you make a temporary catalog, a test catalog, and you import those photos and you start to learn how Lightroom Classic works, knowing that those are duplicate copies of photos and that is a test catalog, so at the end of that process, you can delete all of those files with complete comfort. Then, when you really understand Lightroom, you can dive in and manage your overall workflow. And I've mentioned, you know, the video courses that I've created, I do walk through that process of, for example, importing your photos for the very first time when you're importing your entire catalog, <laughs> your entire collection of photos, your entire library, across your entire hard drive, for example, all as one process, potentially. Uh, and yes, Karen, catalogs can be combined. In fact, I have an article on merging catalogs. And so I will, in fact, for all of you, as my special thank you gift today, I will include that article in the follow-up email. So I'll send a follow-up email after this presentation, letting you know how to access the recording of today's presentation. So Karen, thanks for asking that question. And everyone that is interested in that article, thank you as well to Karen, and that will be included in the follow-up email. All right, and so then, beyond the catalog itself, to the extent possible, I recommend streamlining your storage to the extent possible. So there is a caveat here. So the ideal to me would be to have all of your photos stored on a single hard drive. By single hard drive, I don't mean literally only one hard drive because we wanna make sure to have a backup. I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. 
But if possible, if all of your photos will fit on a single hard drive, I think that's ideal because now you only have one catalog. So when you launch Lightroom, it is your catalog. You don't have to think about, was it in catalog A or catalog B? It's just in Lightroom. And when it comes to looking for your photos, you don't have to look across several hard drives. You just go to the hard drive and look, for example, for the folders. And so if possible, using a single hard drive to store all of your photos. I know many of you are using devices like a Drobo or other hard drive where you can essentially have multiple hard drives in one box and it looks like one big hard drive to your computer. There are a variety of solutions for that. However, some of us, <laughs> the caveat here, are using a solution that doesn't work well. I mentioned that I have somewhere around about six terabytes of photos in my storage library. Probably I should go back and delete some of those to try to clean up some of that, but I tend not to delete too many photos. But I, because I travel so much, I prefer to use external hard drives, and I prefer for convenience that those hard drives be what's called bus powered, meaning you plug in a data cable and that provides the power. You do not need a separate power adapter. So that's convenient, especially when traveling. And I would like my hard drives to be a little bit durable. So what you see here is the hard drive that I use. You can learn more about it with that link there, timgray.me slash rugged4. This is a four terabyte rugged hard drive. It has this rubber bumper around it and it's Supposedly, you can drop it from, I think it's something like six feet, and it will survive. I am not going to test that with my own hard drives. But the challenge, the problem for me is that I have six terabytes of storage, and I'm using four terabyte hard drives. And so there is not an eight terabyte, let's see, rugged hard drive, for example. I would love for them to make one as soon as possible. But in the meantime, I've had to divide my photos across two hard drives, which is less than ideal. But for many of us, of course, that's going to be necessary just by the nature of it. So as much as possible, try to have that overall storage streamlined, ideally a single storage device. Or if you do have to split across multiple hard drives, for example, try to make sure that there's some degree of logic. So what I did, for example, is I prioritized my what I consider my best photos on my primary photos drive and then sort of secondary trips, maybe trips where really I was being more of a tourist than a photographer, those sorts of things go on to the secondary hard drive. Hopefully I have time to clean up and get rid of the photos I don't need before I get to the point that I need a third hard drive, or even better, let's see, we'll come up with a rugged hard drive that is significantly larger. Now, of course, on that hard drive, you're going to have a folder structure. I talked about cleaning up the folder structure a little bit, ideally before you start using Lightroom Classic. Another topic to consider, I know some of you will disagree with this and that's okay, but possibly, that's why I put that in parentheses, possibly avoid date-based folders. Now, there are a couple reasons for this. For me personally, date-based folders are essentially uh, meaningless <laughs> because I don't remember what day of the week it is half the time. I have to stop and think about what year is it right now. If someone asks how old I am, first I have to try and remember what year it is currently and then do the math. So I'm not really a date person generally. And so for me, that structure doesn't make sense. If I'm looking for a folder, I'm pretty much never going to know the date that it was captured. And so for me, a structure that is more meaningful to me personally, which I'll talk about momentarily, makes more sense. That said, some of you, and I've talked to these photographers, I'm not sure if they're being honest, but I'll take them at their word, but I will ask them, you know, when did you last photograph in Alaska? And they can name a month and year. I'm very impressed. So if you're one of those people, then by all means, if date-based folder structures work best for you, then certainly, by all means, please feel free. Or if you have other reasons, you just wanna make sure that the folders are sorted by date and then you'll use keywords, for example, or you can add, of course, a location to the date folder. So it can be the date plus the location. I'll talk more about that momentarily. That certainly can work, especially because thankfully, in Lightroom Classic, you can essentially search your folders. You can filter. So you can perform a text-based search when you're looking for a particular folder, for example. But if you're going to be using a date-based folder, be very, very careful. For example, you might notice here, 
I have a 2014 parent folder and then a series of, in this case, month and day folders inside of that 2014 folder. Then there's a 2016 folder with a similar structure, except the 2016 folder went inside the 2014 folder, not onto the parent folder on the hard drive. And so when you're using a date-based folder structure upon import in Lightroom Classic, it's critically important that you pay very careful attention to where those folders are going so that the structure is as it should be with a year, month, and day type of structure, for example. So do be careful about that if you decide that you want to use a date-based folder structure. I see a question from Claire. Can you delete the old catalogs? Yes, great question. So when you upgrade from an older version of Lightroom to a newer version of Lightroom, for example, a major release where the catalog needs to be updated, now you have a, an additional copy of your catalog or backup catalogs or after you've merged catalogs, by all means, yes, you can delete the older catalogs. I tend to take a little bit more cautious approach, and so I would rename the old catalog to make sure that I don't accidentally open it. I'll put the word backup in all caps at the beginning of that folder name, for example, or the catalog name to make sure that I don't accidentally open it up thinking it's my current catalog. And then I'll just move those into a different location temporarily. I don't need to keep those backups forever, but for example, when you've merged two catalogs, instead of deleting the catalog that you no longer need, I would tend to rename it so you don't accidentally open it, but hold on to it for a little while just to make sure that everything is as it should be. All right, and then when it comes to folders, a meaningful and consistent folder structure, I think, is really important. And there's not a single answer that works for all photographers. For some photographers, absolutely, using a date-based folder structure makes sense. And if that works for you, that's wonderful. I often like to joke that wedding photographers or portrait photographers have it the easiest here because their folder structure is simple. It's just based on the client name, for example, the name of the couple that's getting married. And so in that type of context, very straightforward. Of course, they have to be able to create great, wonderful photos of people, you know, in the context of a wedding, that's a lot of stress. But when it comes to folder structure, at least, wedding photographers have it relatively easy. I would maybe classify myself sort of as a travel photographer. Most of my photography involves traveling somewhere. And so for me, it's reasonably straightforward. I use the location. But really the approach I recommend here is that when you think about your photos, when you're looking for a particular photo, what comes to mind? And whatever that is should probably represent the first word or words in the folder names. So for example, if I'm looking for a photograph of a crop duster or of a red barn, well, those are the types of subjects I photograph out in the Palouse. And so I'm going to think Palouse. It makes perfect sense for me to start that folder name with Palouse. Notice I still put the years, especially in the case of locations where I visit various times, numerous times, I still include the year so that I can distinguish one trip from another, for example. In some cases, the month as well, if it's a location that I visit multiple times in a year. And so you might notice at the bottom of the list of folders here, I have a folder called Southwest Road Trip. Well, I could have maybe called it Grand Canyon if my primary focus was to visit the Grand Canyon and I also visited a handful of other locations. The point is that I'm naming folders based on what makes sense for me, how I think about my images. And that might mean something totally different for you. The key is to have something that makes sense, that is meaningful to you personally as the sort of definition, the structure for your folders. And then also very important to be consistent, to use the same overall structure so that when you view your folders alphabetically, they're sorted in an order that makes sense, that makes it reasonably easy to navigate among those folders and hopefully locate the photo that you're looking for. Another thing that I strongly recommend in the context of Lightroom Classic is to really make full use of the import feature. I know that many photographers have a preference to download their photos first, 
maybe use a third-party application to browse their photos. Maybe they have an application that's faster at browsing their images in terms of being able to sort through and find the keepers and delete the outtakes. But my recommendation, my preference, is to make full use of import so that you're really streamlining your workflow. You're not importing, you're not downloading first with one software application and then later importing those photos into your catalog, sometimes possibly forgetting to import certain folders full of photos or a certain batch of photos. And so making sure that you're keeping that workflow as streamlined as possible and also taking full advantage of everything that Lightroom has to offer in that context. And so taking a closer look at some of the details here, the section, so you can see over on the right side of the import dialog, I'm not going to go into detail about all of the aspects of importing, but some of the details that I think are important found in sections over on that right panel. Number one, in the file handling section, I recommend building standard previews so that the previews are being built for your images during the import process, so then even if your external hard drive with your photos is disconnected from your computer, you can still see your images. Also, that don't import suspected duplicates checkbox can be a lifesaver because you don't want to have duplicates, multiple copies of the same photos in your Lightroom catalog creating all sorts of confusion. And so I recommend turning on that don't import suspected duplicates checkbox so that if, for example, you download photos from a media card, you put that card back in the camera, you start capturing images, you forgot to reformat the card in the camera, now you have the same photos that you had previously imported still on that card in addition to new captures where well, you can simply download, import from that card, and have Lightroom not import the images that are duplicates. And of course, you can review which images have been identified as duplicates to help make sure that they really are duplicates. And also making a backup, a second copy of the photos as they're being downloaded, as they're being imported into Lightroom Classic. And so, for example, I typically am downloading my photos and copying them over to an external hard drive. I will also have Lightroom make a second copy on my desktop, on my computer, so that I can then have that additional copy as a sort of extra backup until I've gone through my normal backup process for the photos themselves, which I'll talk about a little bit later. If you prefer to rename your photos, generally speaking, I like to take care of this during the import process. So you could use a meaningful file name for all of your photos. This isn't something I consider to be especially critical, by the way, because Lightroom will make sure that you don't have the same file name in the same folder and essentially the file name represents something of a serial number but especially if you're ever going to send photos out to clients it's a great idea to have a meaningful file name you could put your photography business name as the beginning of the file name for example a little bit of additional promotion of your brand as it were when you're sharing photos with clients and so I would say that Renaming can be very helpful. I generally prefer to perform that renaming during import if I'm going to rename. That said, another consideration here, many photographers do not like having gaps in the numbering for their files, and so they'll wait until they've deleted their outtakes, then they will rename that batch of photos at that stage of the workflow. The caveat that I would mention there is that there is a risk. If you're renaming photos later in your workflow, there's a risk that there will be some reference to the quote-unquote old name and you may have a difficult time locating the new file. So if you've sent an image out to the client then later renamed all your photos from that photo shoot, they're referencing the old name, you could have a little bit of a challenge. But that's generally a somewhat minor issue or at least something that doesn't necessarily affect all photographers. In addition, during import, a couple of things that we can apply during that process. Number one is develop settings meaning we can adjust the appearance of the photo. Some photographers would use this, for example, to have a, a, an image that appears the way they typically are going to interpret the image. For example, their style is black and white. They convert everything to black and white. And so they might use a develop preset applied during import to just convert every image to a basic black and white interpretation to make it easier and more appropriate, really, to review those photos in the context of more or less what they might look like in the final version. Obviously not completely final, but at least a good starting point. I use these develop settings 
in order to apply the things that I want to make sure, essentially changing the default settings. And I might have a couple of these different options depending on which images I'm working with, but I apply things like lens corrections, profile-based lens corrections, or I might change the noise reduction settings, for example. And so I would say that there are a variety of different reasons that you might, but I definitely suggest considering applying a develop preset during the import process and also a metadata preset. So we can take our copyright information and our contact information, any information that applies equally to all of your photos can be helpful to get that added right at the time of import and also keywords. Now keep in mind, when you're applying keywords during the import process, you are applying keywords to all of the photos that are being imported. And that usually means you cannot add very many keywords. So here, for example, at the beginning of this import section, you might have seen I had a couple of photos of red barns and uh, some photos of a crop duster and a few photos of a canola field. Well, I can't use red barn and crop duster and canola field as keywords because those subjects do not appear in all of the photos. So I can only use generalized keywords but I still like to apply those basic keywords. It only takes a moment to add those keywords and they can prove helpful later in your workflow. And then being very careful about that folder structure. So again, depending on your particular approach to folder structure, generally what I recommend is that, for example, if you're storing your photos on an external hard drive, you would essentially set the destination for the import to that external hard drive. And then down in the destination section on the right panel in the import dialog, you would specify that you want to put your photos into a subfolder in that location and give that subfolder a name and generally organize into one folder. Of course, the exception might be if you want to organize by dates, then you would not use a subfolder typically. And then you would organize by date, of course, specifying the date format that you want to use. And so a very simple approach where we're identifying the hard drive and then specifying which folder we want to use as part of that process. All right, and then once those photos have been imported, we did a little bit of keywording right from the start, right when we were importing our photos, but keywords in general can be very helpful. So I know there are seemingly countless metadata fields that you can find over on the metadata section of the right panel in the library module that can be daunting and overwhelming to say the least, but most of that you probably don't need depending on what you do with your photos. Obviously, if you're submitting images to a stock agency, then you need to take that into account. But keywords in general, I'd say, can be one of the most valuable pieces of metadata. And it's important to keep in mind that keywords provide two basic benefits. So of course, number one, Keywords enable you to locate images of particular subjects. If I'm looking for a statue, maybe a statue on the water, I could search for keywords statue and water and come up with this image. But there's a second direction, you might say. So keywords kind of go in both directions. I can search for an image based on keywords, but I can also locate an image and then be reminded of where that was. In this case, I happen to recall that the image was captured in Croatia, but I couldn't tell you the name of the town. But in the keywords field, I can see the name of the town. Somehow, I do remember how to spell it, but I always forget which is the correct way to pronounce it. I think it's Opatia, but it might be Opatia. I forget where the, the emphasis is, but all more to the point here is that it's a location name that I'm not likely to remember and I want to be reminded of, and keywording can help me make sure that I am able to find my photos, which is really kind of the whole point of not having a mess in Lightroom Classic, is being able to locate your photos, and keywords can really help tremendously, both in terms of locating a photo in the first place and being able to identify the subject matter, for example, in a photo once you have located an image. And then when it comes to keywords, one other concept related to keywords is to consider the notion of fake keywords. And this is the term that I use uh, 
They're not really fake. We really are adding them as keywords to our images, but they're not keywords in the traditional sense of identifying the subject matter, for example, in the photo or maybe the mood of the photo and those sorts of things, but rather they are keywords that I think of as sort of being workflow oriented. And so here, taking a closer look at the keywords for this image, you'll notice, of course, black and white, that's sort of a uh, context, uh, you know, a topical type of a keyword. Campo de Fiori, which is the location in Rome where this door was captured. It's a door, it's in Italy, it's Rome. But I also have Instagram share. And that keyword means that I have shared this image to Instagram. So I come up with my own sort of fake keywords terms that mean something to me. Maybe it's an image that was used in a book or a calendar. So you might have a keyword of calendar-2020, as the case might be, or maybe with a topic or what have you. The point is using keywords beyond what we normally think of keywords as being used for to help us to keep track of various attributes of our images. This, by the way, is something you might use a collection for in Lightroom Classic. I tend to use smart collections based on a fake keyword rather than a normal collection. Part of that is it makes sure that I then use those keywords, keeping in mind, I'll talk later about saving metadata for your images. The metadata does not include collections. When you save metadata out to the photos themselves, the collections in Lightroom Classic are not part of that metadata. Those are Lightroom specific features, whereas keywords will be included. So it helps to make sure that you essentially aren't as dependent on your Lightroom catalog. All right, so if you, we'll take a couple of questions here before we move on. And so Richard's asking, how do you link the multiple hard drives? And so actually it's very straightforward. You may have noticed previously there were multiple hard drives listed under the folders section, the folders section on the left panel in the library module. If you import photos from one hard drive to another, meaning if you import on, let's call it Photos 1 versus Photos 2, those two hard drives will appear individually in the folders list. And so you'll have sections, essentially, amongst those folders, one for the first hard drive, another for the second hard drive. And when you import, you can choose which of those drives you want to copy your photos to. And in fact, if you fill up a hard drive, you could also create a new folder on an empty hard drive inside of Lightroom Classic, and that empty folder, maybe you call it Photos, for example, will appear as a folder on that new empty hard drive inside of Lightroom Classic so that you can actually copy fol folders or photos from the first hard drive to the second hard drive, for example. Ah, so real, James asked earlier about the date-based folders and I had that mistake where the 2016 folder was inside the 2014 folder. How do you go about fixing that? It's actually quite simple. I don't have that type of folder structure visible here at the moment, but at the top level, to make sure that I don't have that hidden, yes, yeah, so at the top level, so this is just a sample catalog, a demo catalog that I'm looking at here. If I need to move a folder into a different location, of course, I need to be able to see that folder. And so if a folder needed to go up into a higher level, well, I can't see that higher level. The 2014 folder in the context of that date-based structure I showed earlier, the 2014 folder was directly on the hard drive. Just as these fo folders that you see here are directly on the hard drive, but I can't get directly to the hard drive. I can't, for example, drag a folder to the hard drive itself, but if I right click on any of those top level folders, then I can choose the option to show the parent folder, which typically would show us the hard drive itself. And then I could drag. So in this context, let's say that this was the 2014 folder and this was the 2016 folder underneath it, I could drag that 2016 folder and drop it onto the hard drive itself. And then when I'm finished with that, assuming that I don't need to see the hard drive itself in this context, I can right click and then choose the option to hide this parent so that I'm back to my only my top level folder structure for that list of folders. Yeah, so I see Karen had asked, can catalogs be combined? Yes, and we'll send the details about that. 
Can date folders be renamed? Yes, absolutely. So if, for example, you had been using a date-based folder structure and you decide that you like my approach or someone else's approach better using a different folder structure, you could go back and move things around. In fact, I have a lesson in that Cleaning Up Your Mess in Lightroom Classic video course. There is a lesson specifically about cleaning up those date-based folders that I think you might find helpful as well. So yeah, and I should mention, by the way, also that in that video course, it includes merging multiple catalogs as a video demonstration and also how to locate and reconnect missing folders and photos, consolidating your folders in general, dealing with meta metadata mismatches. So all sorts, of, basically all the stuff we're talking about, if any of it is not streamlined in your catalog, then that course can help. So if you're already a Gray Learning Ultimate Bundle subscriber, by the way, you have access to that course and you can sign into your current account on the Gray Learning website and watch those videos and help get things cleaned up. All right, oh, so we already saw those fake keywords. Going back then to the catalog itself, I think it's also important to back up your catalog. We'll talk about photos here momentarily. But as I mentioned, the catalog, the Lightroom catalog, contains information about your photos, a tremendous amount of information possibly about your photos, and so you want to back it up. And so I hear from a lot of photographers, well, I don't need to use Lightroom's backup because I use a backup for my computer. I use Time Machine, for example, to back up your internal hard drive where the catalog is located. That's all well and good, but one of the reasons that I still recommend backing up with Lightroom is for a couple of additional bonus features that are included in that backup. So first, in the catalog settings dialog on the general tab, you can choose down there at the bottom, you see once a week when Lightroom exits, you can choose the frequency daily, weekly, every time you exit Lightroom, depending on how often you're working, etc. There's even an option for the next time I exit Lightroom so that as soon as you quit, you'll be prompted. So if you've been doing a lot of work inside of Lightroom Classic, then you might want to say, I need to back up right now. So go ahead and choose that next time option and then quit Lightroom. And you will be prompted when you exit, either after that time frame has passed, so after a week has passed, for example, or the next time you quit, then you'll see the backup catalog dialog when you do quit. And the reason that I recommend making use of this option, even if you're backing up your catalog through some other software, is because of those two checkboxes that you see. Number one, Lightroom will test the integrity before backing up your catalog, essentially to try to catch any corruption before it occurs. And so that potentially can save you from a problem that would be otherwise unrecoverable potentially, especially if you did not have a recent backup. And then also to optimize the catalog after it's finished backing up so that performance will be improved within Lightroom Classic. So optimizing the catalog is part of that process. I recommend taking advantage of both of those options. There are great reasons to use the built-in backup feature for your catalog, even if you're otherwise already backing up that catalog. Keep in mind, however, that this backup is only for the catalog itself. It is not backing up your photos. And so you'll also want to make sure to back up the photos themselves. I use a piece of software called GoodSync. You can get information about GoodSync by pointing your web browser at timgray.me slash gray backup. You see the link up at the top right corner there. That happens to be the solution I use. GoodSync did recently, fair warning, switch to a subscription model, which might cause you to want to use a different option. But there are a variety of other solutions as well. The key to me my preference is to use a synchronization type of backup where I'm synchronizing from my primary hard drive to my backup hard drive. And in fact, I do that twice. You'll see here at the top of the list of jobs over at the top left corner of GoodSync or near the top left corner, there is photo four to photo four, both a back as in backup and back two, meaning a secondary backup. So I have my photos drive and I have two backup drives and I alternate backing up one versus the other, so that at any given time I have two full backups, and they represent an exact copy. It's not a compressed backup, it is literally a mirror image, well not mirror because that would be reversed, but an exact copy 
of the original hard drive, which means conceptually, if my hard drive fails, I could simply connect my backup drive and Lightroom would be able to see all of my folders and photos in exactly the right place. Now, there is the slight caveat that if you're on Windows, you'd have to make sure that that backup drive that you're putting in place of the failed primary drive had the same drive letter that Lightroom is looking for, or if you're on a Macintosh platform, that it has the same volume label or the name of the hard drive. All right, see a question here from Jeffrey. How many backups of the catalog? Oh, this is another common question. How many copies of the Lightroom catalog do we keep? And that's sort of a, it's a funny question in a way because theoretically I want to maintain a variety of backups, except the reality is if for some reason the only backup of my catalog that was usable, maybe there had been some corruption or you know whatever reason you might invent, if my only Lightroom catalog that was available was six months old, I think I might actually just start with a fresh catalog because now I've got to wonder what has been done in the last six months that's now missing. And that might be more of an issue than just starting fresh. And I'll talk about one of the reasons that I don't worry too terribly much about losing my catalog shortly. All right, and then in terms of image review workflow along the way, I think this is an important topic is number one, defining a workflow for how you're organizing your images, how you're, for example, identifying favorite photos versus not so favorite photos. And there are two issues there. Number one is defining which attributes you're going to use for various purposes. And then the second is to be consistent in that application so that you're making sure that you're using a consistent approach so it's not, you know, color labels for one folder and star ratings for another and pick and reject flags for yet another. So one of the things I did not talk about in the context of that metadata being applied during import, where I talked about importing and applying your copyright and contact information, for example, is the notion of assigning a color label to every image. When I import my photos into Lightroom Classic, I assign a red color label to every single image. This is via a metadata preset. And so every image upon import gets a red color label. And what that red color label means is that I have not yet reviewed that photo to decide if it is a favorite or not. And of course, by definition, when I'm importing my photos, I haven't yet reviewed them. Well, okay, maybe I've looked at some of them on the back of the camera, but the idea is that I've not yet reviewed them. I get a red color label assigned to all of those images so that I know which images have not yet been reviewed. And so I can filter the images by the red color label and start reviewing. And then I use star ratings. I don't recommend pick and reject flags in general, or at least not as your primary method for identifying favorites, because those are Lightroom specific features. If you save those pick flags in Lightroom and then save the metadata out to your photos, the pick and reject flags do not appear in that metadata. So I prefer to use star ratings because they are supported. They are part of an established metadata standard so that, for example, other software applications would be able to see those star ratings. And I happen to use an approach where on my first pass, the image gets either no stars, meaning it's sort of a reject, or I'll even apply the reject flag in order to mark for deletion, essentially. But I get a one star rating for the keepers and no stars for the outtakes. And then later I'll review the images and maybe upgrade some of my favorites from a trip to a two star rating. And once I've started working in the develop module and I really like an image and think it's one of my best, then it might go up to three stars. And ultimately five star for me at least means this is a portfolio image. This is some of my best work. And so conceptually I should probably only have a couple dozen or so five star images in my catalog. And then of course, as part of this workflow, once I've reviewed a set of photos to assign star ratings or no star ratings in the case of outtakes, then I remove the red color label so I know that I have reviewed those images. And so if like me, during a trip, you very often find yourself with not enough time to review all of the photos from a given trip, from a given day even, those red color labels will help remind you that those are the images that still need to be reviewed. And going a step beyond that, thank you so much, Adobe, we also have the ability to assign color labels to folders. So I can mark a folder as essentially, in this case, a red color label, meaning 
there are images in this folder that I've not yet reviewed. So I need to, well, in this case, I need to get to work and continue reviewing the images within these folders. We can also, by the way, mark folders as favorites. So down near the very bottom of this list of folders, you can see the Palouse 2018 folder has a little star attached to the folder icon. That means that image has been marked as a favorite. And we can filter based on the color labels or the favorite status on that folder list so that we can see only the folders with red labels, for example, or only the folders marked as favorites. And to set all that, by the way, you can right click on a folder and choose to set it as a favorite or to add a color label. And you can, of course, add or remove those attributes as needed. And then another thing for me, I mentioned that most of my, much of my photography involves travel. And so for me, the map, the map module in Lightroom Classic is just absolutely invaluable. This is part of the reason because location information is important to me, I made a point of buying a camera that includes a built-in GPS receiver so that my photos will have location GPS coordinates in metadata right from the start so I can browse my photos on the map. So as I like to say, if any of you are looking for an excuse to buy a new camera, if your camera does not have a built-in GPS receiver, this is my recommendation. Go out and buy a new camera because if you travel a lot for your photography, that information I think can be invaluable. There are of course ways that you can record a GPS track log with a smartphone, for example, and synchronize that with your photos or just capture a photo with your smartphone as a reference image so that you can then add your images to the map later. But the key is if location information is helpful in the context of your overall workflow to absolutely leverage that information, that location information, so that you can, for example, remind yourself of photos just by browsing on the map or remind yourself of where a photo had been captured. And that's just one of the ways that I tend to locate particular images. But another consideration is to be familiar with the various filtering options within Lightroom, meaning how can I find my photos? So here, just a somewhat arbitrary example, I have brought up the library filter bar here inside of Lightroom Classic, and you can see we have some tabs up at the top. I'll zoom in on that. And I, I've set attribute and metadata. So one star or greater, meaning images that are keepers, that are not outtakes. And I've only used the focal length and aperture settings in this case, looking for, in this case, I've gone from 10 millimeter focal length lens all the way up to 24 millimeter, and then lens apertures of f16 to f22, suggesting I was looking for a wide angle image that either had a starburst effect because of that f16, for example, or that was a longer exposure. I'd stop down to get a longer exposure. And this is just one example. The key is to take a look at, especially in this metadata section, you can click any of these column headings, so focal length and aperture here, for example, you can click those headings and choose a different attribute. I want to see images that are horizontal versus vertical, meaning landscape or portrait orientation, or images captured with a particular camera, with a particular lens, with a particular shutter speed, or within a certain date range, whatever the case might be. And by being familiar with these options, number one, you'll have a better sense of how you can actually find your photos, but also then it might affect how you organize your photos. When you start to realize some of the options that you can use for filtering your images that might impact how you're actually organizing your photos in the first place. Now I've talked a lot about some of the different metadata and I mentioned right from the start that by default Lightroom saves all of your metadata inside the catalog. That to me is not enough and so I recommend that we store our metadata information in the photos themselves. And so in the dialog that you see here, this is the catalog settings dialog, and we go to the metadata section of that catalog, the metadata tab as it were. And then there are two checkboxes that I recommend turning on. Well, one in particular, automatically write changes into XMP. And what that means essentially is that your metadata will be written out to the image files themselves. That only includes quote unquote standard metadata. It does not include, for example, membership in collections, as I mentioned earlier. It does not include virtual copies. It does not include pick and reject flags. So some of the Lightroom specific features are not covered by this, 
but all of the standard metadata is, and that includes star ratings, color labels, keywords, etc. And the information will be saved out to the original images on your hard drive. And that means literally the image files themselves for image file formats, such as JPEG or TIFF, but in the case of raw captures, and that's where this XMP comes from, in the case of raw captures, the raw file itself will not be touched in this context. Rather, all of that information will be written out to an XMP sidecar file, a file with the exact same base file name as the original raw capture, but with a file name extension of XMP. That means that as you're applying updates, the metadata updates are being saved out to the images themselves so that if you lose your catalog, if your catalog becomes corrupted or something else goes wrong, you can always essentially just re-import your photos into a brand new catalog and you will have most of your information, including, by the way, the adjustments you applied in the develop module. The history will not be preserved, but the actual settings, the actual changes will still be there for those images. So you're saving, you're preserving most of the metadata by taking advantage of this option. There's also a setting down below here. You must have the first checkbox turned on that automatically write changes into XMP in order for this option to be actually applicable, but you can choose to write date or time changes into the proprietary raw captures. So that if you, for example, forgot to change the time for a time zone change on your camera, you can apply an update to the capture time in Lightroom Classic. But again, by default, that information only goes into the catalog. The question is here, do you want to also update? This does mean that you're modifying the original raw capture. So you'll want to be considerate of that, cautious about that, I guess you might say. But I'm comfortable using this option. Uh, I try to make sure that I don't need it, meaning that I don't forget to change my camera's time when I cross time zones, but inevitably that does happen from time to time. And so that's an option that I personally prefer to take advantage of, but at least, at the very least, that automatically write changes into XMP option, I strongly recommend taking advantage of, that you turn on that option so that your metadata will be preserved beyond the Lightroom catalog. All right, I know we have lots of questions. So do you have questions? Yes, clearly you do. I'll get to as many of those questions here today. I know we've already hit our, uh, our finish time here. We're gonna go a little over time so I can address some of these questions, but I can see there are so many questions that it is well worthwhile to have a follow-up webinar session that is just a question and answer session related to cleaning up your mess in Lightroom. So we'll hold on to all these questions. Any of the questions that I missed, Stay tuned, we'll include information about that session. We'll try to get that scheduled for next week so that we can address more of those questions. Before I do get to those questions, I do wanna remind you that you can get the Cleaning Up Your Mess in Lightroom Classic course at half price if you point your web browser to timgray.me slash mess50. So timgray.me slash mess50 will get you a 50% discount on that individual course. Do keep in mind if you have the Mastering Lightroom Classic bundle of courses, or if you have the Gray Learning Ultimate bundle, then you already have access to this course. But if you have not signed up for any of those Gray Learning bundles and you'd like to get some help cleaning up your mess, this course will help you. It covers basically cleaning up all of the issues that I talked about today if you have problems with them, along with a wide variety of other considerations, other issues you may have. And I should add, by the way, that I do have a one-on-one -on -one help option if you're interested. The Lightroom Cleanup one-on-one, -on -one, you can get all the details about how you can get direct access to me to get your specific issues resolved in terms of cleaning up your Lightroom Classic catalog at timgray.me slash mess help. All right, so let's see if we can get to at least some of these questions today, as many of them as possible before we wrap up. And then We'll uh, address some of those next week as well. All right. Ah, so great question from Roxanne. I know she's noticing that sometimes I use the subfolder by year while in others I don't. And so the folders would vary a little bit. So I'm using, in the example there, there was a parent folder for some of the lists of folders where there are multiple of the same. So for example, in fact, I can bring up Lightroom Classic here and we have, uh, let's see, do we have a good example of that? Not necessarily here. Uh, 
Uh, well, here, here's a couple examples. So we have New York City as a folder in the New York City 2019. I should hasten to add that this catalog is just a demo catalog. So there are some inherent messes here that would not be reflected in my real catalog. But I have several Palouse folders here that have a date on them. But then for the Italy set of folders, there's a parent folder called Italy. And in the case of the Italy 2018 folder, there are some subfolders. But again, that was really more about demonstrating a concept. I usually wouldn't create subfolders on a sort of per trip basis, for example. But the idea is that I'll use a parent folder when the list of folders, so for example, Italy, starts to get a little bit long. And so I've been going to the Palouse region of Eastern Washington State, for example, for about the past 10 years. So I have, you know, 10 or 11 folders and that starts to become a little bit cumbersome. So I would create a new parent folder called just Palouse and then put those subfolders inside of it. So it's just a way to tidy things up so that, for example, I have a series of Italy folders. Well, I can collapse that to just Italy. And so I just find that I don't have a hard and fast rule, but once it starts to feel like a little bit of a long list of folders, then I'll create a parent folder for those. So here I don't have all of my Palouse folders included in this catalog, but certainly in my proper catalog, I do have a parent folder for Palouse because I have 10 or 11 folders for Palouse and that starts to become a little bit of a, a long list essentially. And Evelyn's asking for that a repeat of that link for the discount. So I will put that up here for you. timgray.me slash mess50 if you want that cleaning up your mess in Lightroom. Note the dot me, it's not a dot com. That's just a special shortened URL to make it easier to type. All right. Uh, so Rich asks a real good question here in terms of if you, you know, stop using Lightroom Classic and you obviously you still have access to all of your raw photos. So what about all of the adjustments? Well, a couple of things. First off, if you discontinue your subscription, you still actually can use Lightroom. You just are limited in terms of features. So for example, being able to work in the develop module. So there are some limitations, but you still have your overall metadata. But there are a couple options. You could, of course, as I mentioned, save that metadata out to the photos, which includes the develop module adjustments. The problem with that, of course, though, is that other software doesn't understand that metadata. The only options for you would be to be using Lightroom or to be using Photoshop or to some extent Photoshop elements. And so if you're not going to have access to Lightroom, you're probably not gonna have access to Photoshop either. And so in that context, the solution would be to export an additional copy of the images. So to export as a TIFF image, for example. And so the option to export, you can actually export the original file, meaning the original raw capture, and that will enable you to include all of that metadata because when you export a raw capture from Lightroom Classic, the XMP sidecar file that contains the information about that raw capture is included along with the image. I see we have a question about the keyword set. So in one of those dialogues or one of the screenshots that I was demonstrating, I showed, or at least it showed a keyword set that was visible. And so let's go ahead and take a look in Lightroom Classic here, if we go into keywording, then we have some keyword sets, and those are saved categories of keywords, essentially. And so here are some examples that are included in Lightroom. So outdoor photography is a keyword set, and then there are a set of keywords included there, and I can simply click on any of those keywords to add them as a keyword. So if I click on, let's see, this would have been in June. Well, it depends on when the first day of spring was that year, but let's assume this was a summer photo. I can click summer and that gets added as a keyword. And so I usually use sports as an example here. You could create your own keyword set. And so for example, you can go into edit set and define your own keyword set. 
So if it were sports photography, maybe the names of the players, for example, you can see there's only nine keywords included in a set. So that could start to become a problem, especially with sports that have a large number of players. But at least for sort of the top players, the ones that are going to get photographed the most. Or if you're a wedding photographer, of course, then as you'll see here, there is a built-in keyword set for wedding photography. So there's the bride and the groom and the wedding party, etc. But again, you could define your own keyword set. So make changes to the keywords themselves here, and then you can save your updated set as a new preset, essentially as a new keyword set so that it would be available on that list. So that can be a helpful way to streamline that keywording process. Again, especially for those in situations where you'll be assigning the same keyword. So, you know, you go on Safari in Africa and you would obviously see a variety of animals. You'll see, you know, elephants, hopefully, and zebras, and et cetera, et cetera, and hopefully lions. But the idea then is you could create a keyword set for that Safari so you could just click on that particular keyword. Um, and so, yeah, I asked about, there was a previous question about the catalogs. And so I sort of addressed that, but specifically how long should you keep backup catalogs? I would say anything over six months. What I typically do is save catalogs, any catalogs, backup, uh, backup copies of my catalogs that I've created in about the last month. I'll usually keep, and depending on how much traveling I'm doing at any given time, that might be just a weekly backup, for example. And then I'll save one that's also a few months old, and I'll save one that's about six months old. But as I mentioned earlier, I would say that, generally speaking, if I've made changes, you know, if I'm applying those various changes to my overall structure, then uh, it's going to be possibly problematic. All right, looking at the questions here. Oh, ah, so Sharon asks, that's a great question, a fun question. Can the map be exported as an image? Not exactly. So if we go into, in fact, I'll just switch to all photographs here and switch to the map module and take a look at the map. And so we see a spread of images. So I can't exactly export this, but you could capture a screenshot of that. So. Here I've used the shift tab keyboard shortcut to hide the panels. You can also press the letter T on the keyboard to hide the toolbar down below and you can pan around the map. There's also on that toolbar the option to zoom in or out if you just need a particular section of the map, but then you could capture a screenshot of that in order to essentially preserve a copy of that map. All right, winding down here. I know we've gone over time. We definitely will schedule an additional webinar in terms of addressing the some of these questions that we're not going to get to here today. Let's see. Ah, so yeah, Gina asked, in terms of folder structure, can we have embedded? Well, obviously, yes, I guess <laughs> I addressed that already in terms of having those multiple folders. But in addition, how far can we go? So I've got a, an Austria folder with a couple of subfolders, for example. Can we go deeper than that? Yes, absolutely. I'm not sure if I have any examples here specifically. It doesn't look like it. But the point is that, yes, I could create, well, I think, in fact, in Italy I did. So I have an Italy parent folder, and then I have Italy folders by year. And in one of those, I have some locations within Italy. But I could also create... In, for example, folders by neighborhood in Rome, so the Trastevere folder, etc. And so there is no limit. It, whatever you can create on your hard drive is, in terms of that folder structure, you can have reflected here. I would also add that if you start getting too deep with that folder structure, it obviously starts to become a little bit cumbersome. And so generally, I try to keep my folder structure relatively flat Typically, my, in my actual workflow, I would have one level for most of my folders and then possibly a second folder for consolidation. So when I have made you know, multiple trips to Italy, for example, I'll make an Italy parent folder so that I can collapse, but that's about as far as it goes. So the folder structure you see here with subfolders for that Italy 2018 folder, that's not actually something that I typically do. I would use keywords, for example, to separate out that information.
All right. Well, thank you once again for joining me. I know we went a little bit over time, but I wanted to try to get to as many of those questions as I possibly could. Again, keep in mind, if you want to get that Cleaning Up Your Mess in Lightroom Classic course, timgray.me slash mess50. And if you're interested in getting one-on-one -on -one help to get your Lightroom catalog cleaned up and organized, you can visit timgray.me slash mess help to get details about that. We will send a follow-up email with additional details and including information about a webinar where we will address the remaining questions that we didn't get to today. We'll address all of those or as many of those as we possibly can in an upcoming session. But thank you so much for joining me here today. I hope you found this information to be very, very helpful in your own workflow. And I'll look forward to seeing many of you in a session. We should get that scheduled for next week where I'll address more of the questions that were asked along the way today. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Tamron for sponsoring the Gray Learning webinar series. And thank you for tuning in.